welcome to Diecast Restos and to this uninspiring Ferrari 512S by Corgi. I don't quite know how they managed it, but they have made what is a hugely exciting sports car look very dreary. With its clear red paint, single number 6 sticker and bog standard little and large wheels, it strikes me as being boring. So my mission is to build a custom 512, recreating one of the original 25 cars that were built between 1969 and 1970. The casting is based on the 1970 24 Hours of Daytona entry, but I'll be basing mine on the 1970 Scuderia Filippinetti 24 Hours of Le Mans entry. The number 16 car was driven by Italian drivers Corrado Manfredini and Giampiero Moretti. I chose this car as, of the decals available to purchase in 1 in 64 scale out there, this one best matched the casting spec. The main difference between the Daytona and Le Mans cars was the engine cover, if you study the photos. The Daytona had a white engine cover and a silver sill. I've got these great 5 spoke bronze wheels that I think will really fit the bill and bring the whole custom together. I'll be painting the base white like the skirting colour of the Le Mans racer. Obviously the body will be traditional Tamiya TS8 Italian red and that will then be blanketed in my acquired decals. Ferrari's 512S was a 5 litre V12 sports car. This is how it earned the name 512. It was developed in response to Porsche's 917. Porsche had built 25 cars to meet the FIA's Group 5 homologation regulations in 1969. It was a risky investment. In response, Enzo Ferrari sold half of his business to Fiat in order to raise sufficient funds to emulate Porsche's move. The intention was to sell off any surplus cars to privateer competitors. The V12 required greater cooling and a larger radiator than the flat 12 of the 917, which meant the 512 ended up 100 kilograms heavier than its competitor. Similar to the Porsche, the 512S had early teething problems, including suspension and transmission issues. Unlike Porsche, Ferrari stubbornly opted against in-house competition. While Porsche had factory supported entries, including Golf, Porsche Salzburg and later Martini Racing, Ferrari's factory entries were under Scuderia Ferrari's official banner only. They struggled to fill the seats, having few drivers under contract. Privateer teams, including Scuderia Filippinetti, did not receive the same level of factory support as Porsche affiliated entries. Ahead of the 1970 24 Hours of Daytona, Ferrari presented 25 512Ss to the FIA, 17 complete and 8 assembly kit cars. 19 of the 25 would race in 1970, 5 of which were Spiders. Ferrari had failed to sell all of their surplus cars, unlike Porsche who had by now produced over 50 917s. Ferrari did take third at Daytona behind two 917s. It was the only 512 finisher, the remaining 4 cars retired. It took its first and only championship win of 1970 in the 12 hours of Sebring. The 1970 24 hours of Le Mans was the year that Hollywood rocked up at Circuit de la Sarve, with the race providing the background for the Steve McQueen movie Le Mans. A camera car had been entered into the race by Solar Productions, McQueen's production company. This was a Porsche 9082 that had bulky cameras fitted across the car. That in fact finished the race with 282 laps completed, albeit not classified. The Ferrari works team brought along four 512S cars for the race, all the newly developed long tail Coda Lunga models that offered improved aerodynamics. A further four were entered by privateer teams, including Filippinetti, while three original 512Ss, like this casting, were entered, bringing the total to 11. During the race, the first works 512 fell after just 7 laps with an engine problem. At 5.30pm when heavy rain arrived, Reina Vassal in the sister Filippinetti 512 of the car I'm basing my custom on had slowed due to an oil streaked windscreen. Behind him arrived a quartet of battling Ferraris. 
Sam Posey in the NART 512 passed by, but unsighted, Clay Regazzoni's Works 512 smashed into Vassal, followed by Mike Parks in the other Filippinetti. Derek Bell in the third Works 512 managed to avoid the accident, but broke down half a lap later due to gearbox damage. Just a note here, my wonky pen lines are intentional to replicate the duct tape seen surrounding the lights on the real number 16 512. Just six of the original 11 512s remained, with only five hours of the race having passed. The next to go was Helmut Kellner's NART 512, who hit the barriers in torrential rain after swerving to avoid a spinning car. Then came my car, the number 16 of Corrado Manfredini and Giampiero Moretti, who had to retire the car for Filippinetti 13 hours and 111 laps in due to a transmission problem. Scuderia Filippinetti were out of the race. The next 512 to go was the Spider of Escuderia Monduic after 12 hours, before the final Ferrari Works car exited the race in tragic fashion. Jackie Ix had been charging through the field in adverse conditions, reaching second place at midnight. He then tried to unlap himself against Joe Siffert's 917K when the car's rear brakes failed. The car crashed into a sodden sandbank and launched over it, bursting into flames and killing a trackside marshal. Ferrari's challenge to Porsche was effectively over. Two 512s were classified, Sam Posey and Ronnie Bucknam's NART in fourth with 313 laps, and Ecurie Francochamps entry came fifth with 305 laps completed. Now with my handy guide on screen to help me lay out my decals, I begin to recreate my choice of one of the many retired 512s from the 1970 Le Mans race. I'll keep this on screen so you can see what I'm working on. Filippinetti used a red livery with a white stripe running down the centre to reflect the Swiss flag where the team was based. By the end of the 1970 season, Ferrari had won just one championship race, while Porsche took the remaining nine wins. But towards the end of the season, Ferrari did debut a modified 512 called the 512M. This had greater power and improved aerodynamics. It gave Ix and Ignazio Giunti a win at the Nine Hours of Kyle Army in November that year. However, Enzo Ferrari had grown impatient with his failed project, with the 512M relegated for use by privateer teams only. He was aware that with the 1972 regulation change, cars would be limited to 3 litre engine capacities, and so launched the Flat 12 312 PB project. The 512 S and M were raced competitively in 1971 by privateer teams, including NART, who took second and third at Daytona. There was one 512 M works entry in 1971, which won the 300 kilometers of Imola, driven by Arturo Mazzario. So far, you've seen me apply part of the white stripe of Filippinetti, the number 16, the lucky black cat of SAV Marshall headlights, Longines watches advertising, electrical cutoff and fire extinguisher decals, shell oil lettering for the front, and the Scuderia Filippinetti ensign above the side intakes. On the rear wing are DuPont Nomex fire resistant materials decals, separated by some more of the Filippinetti stripe. Further shell lettering is added to the rear winglets. On the inner edge of these winglets goes a tiny Volante Momo steering wheel advertisement. These were incredibly fiddly to fit considering the small area they needed to be applied to. The rear quarter received Ferrodo brakes logos, and I add in some more of the stripe. On this side only goes a Magneti Morelli logo, as the other side of the car will receive another circular number 16 in the equivalent position the second of five 16s on this car. Again, only the left side had these combined Goodyear tyres and Ferrodo logos fitted. Between those and the Magneti Morelli logo is the Scuderia Filippinetti wording. Each side receives a Coney shock absorbers logo. 
This is pretty difficult to make out on screen without zooming in. Above the front winglet is a barely distinguishable Borg and Beck Clutches logo, next to a Trico Wipers logo. That was the final sponsorship to be applied, excluding all the mirrored editions. The final decal to be applied, for now, is the completion of that stripe to now allow it to run front to back. To help set the multitude of decals, I apply Mr. Mark's softer solution. I've managed to condense that entire process into less than four minutes. In reality, it took me well over an hour and a half. It's definitely the most work I've put into any decal clad casting to date. I add some chrome to the rear of the base section and again add in the central front lights that I had covered over with the decal. I also gave that the drawn in duct tape surround. All those decals and details are locked in with a coat of clear lacquer. I also add in a touch of light weathering on the engine cover to help those grooves stand out. While it is time to finally reassemble the model, it doesn't mean this custom is quite finished yet. No, there's still another three number 16s to be applied. Sorry to those of you who skipped the earlier decal application. With the windscreen in and the interior and engine cover piece fitted, I can replace the base and fasten both tapped rivet posts with an M2 screw. The right hand side has two decals that extend over the body to the base section. Hence why I needed to wait until it was fully reassembled to apply these. The left hand side has a single round 16 that mirrors the other. Then the final touch for those three decals is some setting solution, bringing this epic build to an end. This is how the dreary Corgi Juniors Ferrari 512S looked. As I said at the start, this is just such an uninspiring casting. How Corgi managed to make such a bland looking Le Mans and Daytona racer, I just don't know. So I've tried my best to spice it up with a new livery and decals, with some suitable new wheels to aid the process of unboring-ing. And let's take a look at this now properly racy racer. It is worlds apart from what it looks like before, isn't it? From the hand-drawn duct tape headlights, to the brighter red body, to the beaming bronze five spokes, to that contrasting white base, to the sea of decals. Every last millimetre of this casting has been improved in my mind. Instead of an anonymous and forgettable casting, it now tells a story, even if it wasn't one of the great sports car tales of success. It is still a piece of automotive history. I suppose that's a bit of a theme with my chosen race car customs. Rarely have they won the most races or championships. Often they've been blighted by technical or reliability issues. But I think that just adds to the charm and character of the piece. I've lined it up against my custom Corvette from the 1968 24 Hours of Le Mans in Filippinetti colours at the closing credits. If you would like to help support the channel and have your name up in the credits as a thank you, please consider joining up to Patreon or YouTube memberships. The more supporters, the more it will help enable unique customs and epic videos to be put together. Please leave a like and drop a comment with your thoughts on how this casting turned out and to help it extend the video's reach. But all that leaves me to say is thank you for watching and I'll see you again for the next one. Bye for now.